Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode focuses on an area which is too often left out in accounts of how people learn, emotion. From Crathwell to Shackleton Jones, discover the theories who thought and wrote about effective learning. So, Donald, this time we're covering a topic that's guaranteed to inspire a chill of fear in any Brit. But cover it we must because feelings and emotions oh, are an integral part of learning so donald please justify if you can taking us into this perilous territory and tell us about this episode's crop of theorists well uh, effective learning or you know the 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 emotions of what we feel during the the learning journey or process of learning is, is curiously ignored yet yeah, you know i've been a big fan of david hume for uh, nearly 40 years and uh he was the first person who laid out this, uh, the fact that we as human beings are Im- I- I soaked in emotion, you know. Uh, we live our lives in an emotional state of one form or another. It may be just calm, it may be more excited or overstimulated or whatever, but uh, emotion is just fundamental to us as human animals. Uh, and it's terribly important, not only before learning, as you go into learning with your motivations and expectations and so on, but how do you feel about learning during the process, but also after? How do you feel as though you've failed cat- catastrophically, or do you feel you've had some success? And I think everyone has an, you know, when you ask people about learning, it's quite interesting how they do relate their feelings back to you. You know, that if you ask about learning, people often reflect on school, on how they quite liked it, were excited by it, but many, many, of course, a reflect on how boring and dull it was, you know, uh, mm. less, it seemed very dull and remote and almost irrelevant and felt trapped by the whole thing. And even at university, almost everybody I know who did go to university has a, a really vivid experience of sitting there really painfully bored during rather dull lectures. I don't think anybody get, is free from that, almost numbed by the experience. Uh, on the other hand, people have a great deal of pride and achievement uh, as well on top of this. And this is the point about these theorists that we're about to tackle. They all make the point that emotion or feeling, the effective side of learning, is a double-edged sword. It can go both ways. Mm. Now, this, this sort of complex world of feelings has been by and large sidelined because of an accident in history, and that's one of the previous people we talked about, and that was Bloom. So everybody picks up on Bloom's taxonomy of learning, forgetting... <laughs> that it was only one of three aspects. So they focus on the cognitive and sort of throw the affective and psychomotor to one side as if it were a piece of trash almost. Uh, the truth of the matter is Bloom didn't think that. And another uh, theorist, the first we'll be deal- dealing with, his colleague Crathwell comes along many years later and fills out the cognitive side with the affective or emotional side. Now, I think one of the problems here is that By and large, there's a tendency for schools and academia to focus on the academic and pure reason as the primary skill set. But of course, that's at the expense of other forms of learning here. You don't get that from sports coaches, let's say, or people work in uh, perhaps workplace trainers and so on, which is far more about effective learning, these other areas of human uh, endeavour. And of course, I think it's important to remember this emotional thing isn't just the emotions you feel while you're learning. We also internalize our emotions and can use them to propel us forward in learning. So there's a, there's a reflection on our emotions, the way we use and manage our own emotions in the, in the learning thing. So we're, we're going to cover uh, Yak Pants, uh, 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 of course, Crathwell, who picked up on Bloom give us a sort of pyramid of sort of emotions, and then move on to Jack Pansett, who's done some amazing stuff based on the evolutionary heritage we have around emotions. In other words, we can't help it. It's part of our cognitive makeup. And then uh, Damasio and uh, Imordino Yang, uh, uh, as a, a male and female colleagues, who have worked strongly on, on the way in which emotion is critical to learning and the way in which memories are formed. Interestingly, that powerful role as motivators, uh, emotions as motivators, but also in the formation of memories. And then George Lakoff, 
who takes the whole thing into language and the use of metaphors, uh, the, you know, the embodiment of emotions. It's, it's almost as if you're feeling with your body mm-hmm. and that we use special metaphors. You know, uh, we mark people up or we mark them down. Uh, you know, heavens above and hells below. We have these special metaphors all the time that we use because we have an embodied view of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, he thought that was driven by emotion. And then last, Nick Shackleton-Jones, who has pioneered there as an effective learning model. So we'll cover the whole gamut of uh, theories that I, I found absolutely fascinating in this. Of, overlooked, and you know, there's a bit of a vacuum here, I think, for most people. So hopefully we can fill that vacuum. Okay, so let's start with David Redding Crathvoll. 1921 to uh, 2016, so it didn't die very long ago. Educational psychologist, born in Chicago, studied at the University of Chicago with Benjamin Bloom, as you mentioned. Uh, he was also a past president of the American Educational Research Association along, along the way, very important body. Um, he was an important collaborator with Bloom on his famous taxonomy. We covered Bloom in a previous episode of this podcast. Donald, can you tell us about that collaboration, but also what Crathol is known for in his own right? Okay, well, Crathol himself, I mean, I think he's mostly known for this, uh, you know, this filling out of Bloom's original taxonomy. Remember, Bloom's cognitive taxonomy, the pyramid that everyone knows, is only one third of the story because there were it was a tripartite distinction between the cognitive, the, uh, the affective, which we're going to talk about today, and the psychomotor. So Bloom's part one was published in 1956, that taxonomy. However, it was much, much later in 1964, so that's eight years later, that the that the effective uh, taxonomy came out. And it was a similar sort of hierarchy, really, to the original Bloom's cognitive domain. And that's one of its weaknesses, I feel. Nevertheless, he did try and really improve uh, upon upon Bloom's original taxonomy with six different levels of effective learning. Now, these six, these six levels reflect the cognitive levels in the, in the pyramid that Bloom came up with, but they are quite interesting, I think, and give us a general landscape of emotional learning. So you've got characterized, if we start with the, the first level, and that's receiving the bottom of, uh, let's say, an imagined pyramid, which I would disagree with, but that's how it's often presented. The sort of receiving uh, that notion of being open and attentive to knowledge, the idea of increasing levels of internalization. So you start at this baseline here of receiving, uh, reading, listening, you know, that base gathering, note taking and lectures type level. That's the receiving of knowledge level, level one, let's say. He then builds on that and calls the next level a responding. This is where you're actively coming back to the learning material, perhaps rewriting your notes, interrogating them, actively responding, participating and engaging in the learning process. Uh-huh. And that's terribly important because that's a sort of, you know, real effortful learning comes to play here. And that, that's writing essays and all the sort of stuff we might have done at school and university, but yeah. also workplace learning, things like problem solving and so on. Hmm. The third one is valuing. So you've been receiving, responding. The valuing is when you raise the bar a little bit more and you become a little more autonomous as a learner. Uh, so you're reflecting and expressing your opinions. You know, you're bringing more to the party here. Then at the next level up, you go into the organization. And here you're starting to do some deeper analysis, really try, starting to really compare things, ordering content and so on, in such a way that you're building your own learning material and learning from it, often using, you know, analysis and maths or spreadsheets or more sophisticated tools and textual analysis, if it were English literature or in engineering, some mathematical techniques. So that organizational level is the next one. And then it comes up to the last one, and Grathel uh, calls this characterization. And here, you really take control of yourself and your own behaviors uh, in terms of your emotional attitude towards learning. You know, you take, you're much more critical, much more reflective of yourself as a learner. Yeah, that may involve a lot more uh, of a deep dive into collaboration with others, for example, working in teams, mm-hmm. uh, working on social groups online. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's the highest level for him. So there were these... Uh, you know, when you go through these characteristics, there are six levels here. It's a bit too hierarchical for me, but yeah. there you are. I think it lays out the landscape quite nicely. And does it have any kind of basis, empirical basis? 
Yes, I mean, the Bloom and Craftwall, and then, of course, we had, uh, we, we've had other improvements, especially with Laurie, uh, Laurie Anderson, of course, improved upon Bloom's original cognitive domain. They all brought subsequent research, which often had empirical, well, Bloom stuff did have an empirical basis, but they brought subsequent, remember, this was eight years later, so a great deal of new evidence had come to the fore with regard to the effective domain. Okay. Which they absolutely, uh, which uh, will definitely included in that in in those six levels. Yeah, and I remember when we were talking about this stuff with Bloom. There is it. It doesn't necessarily feel as if it rings true that you have to move through these levels from one to the next um, in in that way. That it's kind of hierarchical and a, and a pyramid. Is that a failing of Craftwell's ideas as well? Do you think? Yes, I think the problem with Craftwell is he, that he mimicked the original Bloom taxonomy a bit too much because the emotional landscape, if anything, is even messier and more interrelated than the cognitive domain. Yeah, a uh, 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 the, the way the brain works. You know, we are we are we are a sort of washing machine, a tumble of emotions, as it were, uh, mm. and they move very quickly from acute awareness, let's say, self awareness of yourself as a learner because you haven't un understood thing a way back down into a very basic what i, I don't understand that fact what, what does that sentence mean so mm. i think we're moving around with emotions a lot more than this hierarchy from craftwell would suggest mm. uh, so but still the important thing is that at least he can he give us a sort of taxonomy of sorts yeah. uh, different types of emotion which we're going to apply to motivation and learning Moving on, uh, we may have to be a bit brief with some of these people because we've got quite a lot to fit in. Yeah, sure. Yeah. An Antonio Damasio, 1944 and still alive, and Mary Helen Imordino Yang. I, I yeah. don't have any dates for. So, Antonio Damasio is a Portuguese American neuroscientist, currently the David Dawn Seif Chair in Neuroscience, as well as Professor of Psychology, Philosophy, and Neurology at the University of Southern California. Interesting mix there um, and originally studied at Lisbon uh, University. Together with Mary Helen Imordino Yang, he worked to reinstate the emotions in thought and consciousness. On your blog, Donald, you say that he rejects the Cartesian mind-body dualism. Uh, now, you, you, you were saying at the top about kind of emotions, the emotions might feel at university, and, and immediately I remember emotion here. All I know about René Descartes really is what I read off the back of a toilet wall um, in Sussex University, and it was the uh, philosopher's drinking song from Monty Python, or, or Monty, <laughs> yeah. Pi Monty Python, as you um, Americans say. And and it was uh, René Descartes was drunk and far, I drink, therefore I am. Um, and that's the limit, really, of my knowledge <laughs> about Descartes, which I think absolutely proves that Alexander Pope, the great poet, was right when he said a little learning is a dangerous thing. I have a little learning about Descartes. Donald, you've got a big learning about Descartes. So... Can you reflect on that Cartesian mind-body dualism, um, Damasio's rejection of it, and how that plays into the work of this duo on effective learning? Yeah. Okay, well, Descartes, as an early 17th century philosopher, is the uber-rationalist. So he, he sets about demolishing the world. So what do we really know about the world? Well, not much, actually. It could all be a dream, you know? Everything's an illusion. But he gets around to this fundamental thing in the mind, the self, Cogito ergo sum. Mm -hmm. I think, therefore, I am. I am, and it starts building the world up on on rational demonstration from basic principles, and so he's seen as the father of rationalism in the Western tradition. And uh, interestingly, here the, the 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 first major book that Damasio writes is actually a negative book. It's called Descartes' Error. In mm -hmm. other words. Damasio wants to concentrate on emotion as opposed to reason, but he writes this book in 2005 uh, called Descartes' Error, and it, it, it's an excellent destruction. There are many other books that have done the same thing, showing that the human brain, uh, as Hume rightly said, and I said at the beginning, is actually quite an emotional organ. <laughs> uh, it tends to be emotion first, and that emotion is enmeshed with reason. There is hardly ever reason on its own. We are emotional beings, and even our reasoning uh, has biases, uh, as we'll see later in this podcast. Now, he comes along a little bit later and writes another interest. Uh, 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 sorry, it was a bit earlier than that, because 
uh, about a book about Spinoza. About the same time, Spinoza came a little bit after Descartes, the uh, late last half of the 17th century. But Damasio really loves Spinoza because Spinoza was the antithesis of Descartes, uh, and he wrote a book called Looking for Spinoza. That was all about joy, sorrow, the, the feeling brain, the idea that the brain is fundamentally driven not by reason, as Descartes mm. said, but by emotion. And he thought that Spinoza was the father of this area, you know, in terms of reflection on human nature, as it were, mm. that he refused to separate mind and body as Descartes had done. There is no dualism in Spinoza. Mm. Uh, so Damasio sees him as the precursor for his own theories about consciousness, consciousness being, and emotion. And what was um, Mary Helen Imaldino Yang's uh, contribution to, to this? Well, she's really a bridge into the world of education and teaching. So, you know, she's a research a research coll uh, colleague of his. And so he, la he lays this sort of intellectual high ground for all of this. And they do very practical, uh, you know, research in terms of the way in which emotion causally influences our, uh, a learning. Uh, how the, you know, how feelings generate an, an image of the self was a big thing, that, that mapping of your own body through feelings. Hmm. But she comes in really in terms of, you know, emotion has been pushed to the side as a form of scientific study, but she brings science. They both bring science and biology to the table and looking at emotional as and its role in motivation. That's a big contribution by both of them here. And they often work and publish together. Yeah. Uh, and really, it can be summed up by saying that learners need to care about what they learn. That would be a good way of summing up their conclusion. You know, people only learn when they care about something which drives curiosity and drives people forward in a course. If you lose curiosity, if you lose that emotional input, then you tend to drop out and fall away. Yeah. So all learning for both of these theorists is, is completely subsumed or you know, carried along uh, by emotion. Uh, you know, it's the, I think it's also important to see that the emotion-related process also drives us to apply our knowledge in the real world. It's not just the learning act or the learning process itself. If we're going to really start problem solving and applying what we've learned in the real world, that's also emotionally driven. We need a, a we need a drive to be able to, to push that forward. Now, they summarized all this uh, in a book called Emotions Learning in the Brain, and that was all about the educational implications of what they're saying here. They really do think that education should be redesigned taking emotional the emotional landscape of learners into account and you think there would be quite radical differences that book was published in 2015 so it's quite recent in many ways but they really do believe that we've be we've concentrated too much on the academic uh, cognitive sphere at the expense of the emotional drive especially through motivation by learners and i think that's important because uh, uh, she, in particular, has been very strong in evangelizing this angle in a practical sense in the context of schools. So we're getting a good kind of progress here in, in this definitely feels to be moving towards something, as it yeah. were. Yeah. Um, the next person we, we want to look at is George Philip Lakoff. Uh, 1941, who was born and uh, is still going. Um, he's an American cognitive linguist and philosopher. He's a professor of cognitive science and linguistics at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, where he has taught since 1972. He's best known for his belief in the prima primary role of metaphor in language and thinking. And this is interesting, this is getting us into the world of linguistics. Yeah. I think he did some work on um, uh, either together with or in reaction to Chomsky. Uh, and the idea that metaphor is really central here. I mean, this comes into what I studied, which is English literature. Metaphor is a very, very kind of central part of, of, of that. And I think he was involved in, um, he did some work on uh, the Bush getting us into, or getting uh, the US into uh, the Gulf War and the role of metaphor in doing that um, and, and emotion. So he's worked on politics as well. Um, what is his importance for learning? Okay, well, although George Lakoff is well known for his theory, you know, intellectually for his theory that metaphor is everywhere, it's sort of we think in terms of metaphor, hmm. what people often don't uh, read into him is his 
what, what lies behind that? What cognitive process lies behind that? And he thinks that much, you know, human behavior and beliefs is really deeply rooted in what he calls the embodied mind. And I was don't see the brain as some sort of separate organism, this rational Cartesian thing. It's actually deeply embedded with the central nervous system in the body itself. So for lack of all forms of cognition, you know, how we think, how we talk and reason are all grounded in the emotions, which are in turn embodied. You know, we yeah. feel them, but we feel it as a whole body. It's not just a brain phenomenon in that sense. Mm. And so ideas, yes, it's an interesting thing. He says ideas are really very physical things for us. You know, we feel them at first and yeah. then we utter them. Now, this, of course, this comes through into the whole notion of metaphor, because that's the sort of figurative expression of this. You know, mm -hmm. we transfer this onto almost everything. So you mentioned politics, for example. So we have left and right in politics. You know, we have heaven above us, hell below. You know, we mark students up and down. We have all these spatial metaphors that we use all the time because we are spatial beings. Mm. In, that, in that Kantian sense, you know, that space and time are the fundamental frames in which we think. And so we're constantly comparing, we're constantly taking these abstract ideas and turning them into concrete spatial metaphors. Mm. This is what he's best known for. But I think he really did apply this to learning theory. It wasn't just this, uh, this was an abstract philosophical position he was taking, taking as well as a linguistic position. But when it comes to the sort of physiology of emotions, he thought this was important in learning as well. So in teaching and learning, he was really keen on the teaching of the arts and learning because he thought that metaphor, you know, literature, music, poetry, and so on, used metaphor in such a powerful way that they that was the medium through which we could learn the most. Mm. So he's very keen on, on arts uh, education. I think it's so interesting because, you know, reflecting on literature, one of the things you do as a, as a writer when you're writing is you try to avoid mixed metaphors. Yeah. Um, and this can drive you back to the, the, the kind of provenance of words, because so many words that we use have a metaphorical origin. You, you talk like tenet, you know, tenet, yeah. we, you hold this or that tenet. Um, and that the, the root of that is actually to hold. And I was encountering this just the other day. I, I was going to use the word tenet, and I realised I was going to use it in a sentence that, that would be nonsensical if you thought about where that word actually came from and what it means. And when I first started writing, this led me to to acquire an etymological dictionary, which will tell you what the original meaning of words were, you know, most, mostly in English, Anglo-Saxon and, and Latin. And I, and I find that fascinating. So he's an interesting figure for me, Lakoff, because, you know, I do have a sense of how deeply embedded metaphor is in the way in, in language. And of course, language controls the way that we think. So we, it is full of Im embedded metaphor. Yeah, that, that was a really good example you quoted there because for Lakoff, he thought that, you know, the, when, when you're writing, the act of writing, let's say note-taking mm. uh, in learning, uh, there's a very good paper in this showing that if you note-take and use uh, similes and metaphors, you get a much higher retention level than just ordinary note-taking, even in other in in alternative words. Yeah. So they're very powerful. Now, our lack of really recognized this and thought that learners needed these metaphors. It was a way of internalizing knowledge, especially when you came up with your own metaphors. And you know that as a writer, mm. you know, you're really pleased when you come up with a metaphor and you're likely to remember it more. It's a way of internalizing and explaining and making something concrete, not yes. only for you, but for the, the person you may be teaching or will be reading the stuff you're writing. Yeah. So it helps you generate ideas. And it also helps you remember them, of course. Metaphors are great just in yeah. terms of memory. It's mnemonics, yeah. And it relates something new that you're learning to something that you already know and is in yes. your experience, you know. Um, That's and isn't good. that an important part of how we learn things is to link the new thing to existing knowledge? Yeah. And of course, teachers can use them to explain things, and they often do. That's often, you know, if you find that you someone isn't getting a point, you will yeah. often re-express that point using a simile or a metaphor. Mm. And so he, he explored this in some detail, not only from the angle of teaching to get people through little roadblocks when they get stuck, but also yourself as a learner, uh, when you're writing, taking notes and so on, to use metaphor as a powerful learning technique. But there was this notion of emotional embodiment. You know, he thought this was all rooted in the way we feel about the world. That was That's an important thing, which is why he's in this group of effective learning theorists.
So moving on to our next theorist, um, Yak Pangsek, 1943 to 2017, so yeah. died fairly recently, an Estonian-American neuroscientist and psychobiologist, um, which is an interesting job title. <laughs> His family yeah. escaped the ravages of post-World War II Soviet occupation by moving to the States when he was very young, studied at the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Massachusetts. He coined the term effective neuroscience. And he gave us a list of seven primary effective systems. Um, it, it, it's really great when we, we come across these lists. We have kind of questioned this, you know, especially yeah. the ones that all begin with C uh, in a previous episode. But um, it, in a way, it, it does make kind of uh, learning about this stuff a lot easier. So, <laughs> so his seven primary effective systems were seeking, in brackets, expectancy, fear, anxiety, rage. I'm not going to act these out, especially right. the next one, lust, <laughs> care panic or grief uh, and play. Um, yeah. So Donald, how do these suspiciously close to the seven deadly sins, how, how do these work? Well, I like Panksepp because this little set of seven, he really tried hard to get this little taxonomy of emotions sorted out, you know, okay. and to cover the full gamut of emotions because it's a very complex landscape, obviously. And what he was keen on doing, of course, is include those those destructive emotions as well as the positive and the, uh, uh, you know, ones that's normally associated with personal development. And we can learn a lot from these emotions, you know, the role they play in learning, not only the basis of it, sometimes he thought it was emotional descriptions were the very basis of our personality. Uh, and he split the emotions into primary, secondary and tertiary. But the really important thing about Pansep is his work on learning. And I really like this because we are not animals, you know, we, we, have, we have these emotional things, we can control and regulate our emotions. And some emotions, and so in that list there, you have rage, panic and fear, which are three negative emotions. They're not conducive to learning, obviously. If you're in a rage and angry, or if you're amazingly fearful in an exam, it can actually hinder you know, free expression in an essay or whatever. And panic, of course, it can be a destructive force as well. So three of those things he regarded as negative. And this is important because these people are not blind to the negative side uh, of emotion. I, I love Pansett because he has this landscape of learning, but he's very clear about the three types of emotions that are destructive. You're fearful, obviously, in an exam or towards a learning experience, you know, or a person, you're not going to learn much from them, perhaps. Or if you're in a bit of a panic and overstimulated, that's a negative thing. These are not conducive to learning. But mm -hmm. his focus on the other areas of emotion, and the one that was two that were really important to him, one was the seeking emotion, the yeah. idea that we're actually forward curious creatures, you know, uh, and that we're caught this feeling of enthusiasm about learning. We're learning animals, as it were, we're the teaching and learning species, mm. uh, Homo sapiens, knowing man, you know. This was an instinct, he thought, that comes out evolution evolutionary psychology. So he goes back to evolutionary basis for his theory on this. Mm. Uh, the second big one was play. He was really big on play and thought that the lack of play in young children led to, led to mental disorders in many ways. He mimics a lot of stuff from Vygotsky in this. Getting away from the negative emotions, there are two big emotions that he thought were essential or almost necessary conditions for good learning. Yeah. One is seeking this enthusiasm that we need that drives curiosity, drives a, is a motivational factor in learning. Mm. He thinks this comes from our evolution as a, animals that need this emotion to survive. In other words, it's the basic drive we have to move forward, discover things, and adapt to our environment. Mm. A, so Seeking was the fundamental emotion behind learning for Pangset, but there was a second big one, which he constantly emphasized, and that was play. You might not think that play is emo an emotion, but he thought there were various types of emotions associated with play. There was a physical play, social play in groups, let's say teams, you know, board games and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then beyond that, some exploratory play that we all uh, uh, see in kids when they're pottering about, you know, lo looking under the bed and so on. And then object play, playing with physical things. Now, he mm -hmm. thought that play was a necessary condition for the natural growth and, and also epige epigenetic programming. In other words, the triggers in our genes that make us develop as adults, he also thought were a result of play. Right. And 
like many people, including people like Jonathan Haidt now, he thinks something has gone badly wrong in our culture and that we've limited the spaces in which children can play, the freedom, you know, the sort of pressure that parents put yeah. on kids to be very structured and everything. He thought that this absolutely led to mental illness in children. Interesting. Yeah. And there's a lot of evidence that this may be true. Haidt writes, writes about this a lot hmm. because we're restricting the you know, these activities, the complex neural growth and epigenetic processes that lead to healthy human beings. So it's very, very interesting on this, as was Vygotsky on mm. play. And mm. I have a great deal of sympathy with this. So uh, this is another angle about emotional development. We've seen how the theorists we've talked about so on have described an emotional landscape. Pan's comes in and says, listen, emotions are essential to our cognitive development full stop. And if mm. we thwart or inhibit those emotions, we have real problems in terms of the development of learners or the development of our children. Yeah. And of course, you, the use of metaphor can be a type of play. You know, we talk yeah. about wordplay, but I mean, literally, that is for, you know, a, a, a writer, the language is a sand pit that you go and wiggle your toes around in. Yeah, much exactly. as anything else. One thing this list really reminds me of was making, when we were talking about this, is kind of um, manuals of screenwriting. Uh, and stuff like that, and story construction. You know, you can't have a story without some of these things in there, seeking fear, yeah. rage, lust. You know, it's the first um, first 10 minutes of an episode of Blind of Duty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. And that is it's quite interesting. You need these two to structure a story. We very often use storytelling within learning as well. Yeah. So it, it has a, a, a relevance there to learning as well. Oh, very definitely. I think that drive to communicate is also emotionally driven. Your conversations are quite often run by feeling as opposed to reason. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, there's also a lot of reflection here on the nature of teaching and that teachers often ignore these emotional, the emotional dialectic between the teacher and the, the person that they are teaching mm. at, at, the peril, at their peril because it can hinder learning if you're not keenly aware of what's going on there. So let's move on now to Daniel Kahneman, nine, born 1934, I'm still around, and Amos Tversky, uh, 1937 to 1996. And they're described as the Lennon and McCartney of social sciences. <laughs> uh, and like Lennon and McCartney, were twinned for, for more than a decade um, until they broke up. Kahneman, probably more famous of the two, professor at Princeton, a Nobel Prize winner for economics. Um, this is a name you hear a lot nowadays, very often uh, in discussions of implicit bias, and bias is was, yeah. was sort of his big thing. And that is very timely and very topical. Thinking Fast and Slow is a very oft-quoted book in learning circles for, for those reasons uh, as well. So it's certainly not a case of the only thing you did was yesterday and now that's gone, it's just another day, to quote John Lennon. Um, <laughs> I'm assuming there that everybody is interested in the minutiae of the, the, the Beatles um, 10 years as I am. Um, Donald, tell, tell us about the two of them. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the book Thinking Fast and Slow. You know, I have read that book and I found it a very torturous read. I wonder how many people got to the end of that book. Uh, you know, it's not good prose. And there's an interesting phrase on the second last page, the penultimate page, where he says that all these biases he's been talking about and got the Nobel Prize for, they're uneducable. <laughs> and of course, we spend billions of years trying to train biases out of people. We say, no, well, they're really, you can't really do much about them, to be honest, because they're largely innate. Uh, but there's another very good book, which I highly recommend, called The Undoing Project by uh, by Lewis, which is a, a really brilliant, uh, you know, thriller type book about the relationship between these two guys. But it also mm. includes all the theory. It's a really marvelous little book there. But who can ignore really, you know, well, this you know Nobel Prize winning uh, Kahneman uh, and that theory of a. Uh, you know, thinking fast and slow, system one and system two uh, features of the brain. Uh, by and large, system one is this fast and immediate, without reflection, emotional reaction to things. Yeah. And that's what he brings to the party in terms of effective learning. You know, this is the instinctive, unconscious, la largely, but still emotional reaction we have to learning experiences. Mm. Uh, uh, Damasio and others had identified this before, but Kahneman really brings it to, to the, it brings it to the plate, but in association with system two thinking, mm. 
which is much slower. This is where you bring in reason. You're starting to reflect on things and go, hold on, my emotional reaction might have been a bit rash there. My intuitions might be wrong. You know, mm. the sun might not be going around the earth. Let's do some maths here and see whether it does or not. So he thinks in learning, uh, the danger here is that we, we think, we, we focus on system one, but, but that leads to a sort of overreach. You know, emotion drives us forward too much and leads us into error. So to err is human. Uh, we always have a mixture of this fast and slow thinking, but for Kenman especially, he thought that system one wasn't really educable. You know, this is, this is just the instinctive reptilian brain at work here. And that what we have to do is counter this in organizations. And he's very prescriptive in the book. And not many people get to the bit in the book where he says, this is a remedy here, not to train bias out of people. You can't really do that. What you have to do is change processes. So he's really big. The way you have, what you have to do is block errors in system one. Okay. And that's quite straightforward for Cayman. And here he has very clear uh, uh, ways of doing it. First of all, recognize that you might be wrong on risk and all sorts of things. Then get in processes and procedures, checklists are big for him. He's big on that. Reference forecasts, things he called pre-mortems. And I was change the process you, because you will not change the person. It's a sensational conclusion, really. And if people read the book properly, because these guys were experts in training, you know, they've been brought up in the Israeli army training pilots, came out into, uh, into workplace learning in particular and changed the world in all sorts of ways. We're very, very successful here. On the back of the work on cognitive biases, these anchors and frames that we work with. Mm. And I still don't think in the learning world we've got to grips with what the, he won the Nobel Prize for here, you know. Uh, you know, these cognitive biases are really embedded in all of us. They're culturally universal. Mm. So, you know, we anchor things so that when you go and buy a house, you know, whatever the state agent has expressed as the price uh, in the brochure, as it were, that's the anchor about which everybody thinks yeah. about in terms of the price. That's a good example of anchoring. And you've got mm. to avoid anchoring in learning because it's often misleading. Mm. Uh, but there are many others, the conjunction availability bias, confirmation bias, the conjunction fallacy. And the book is chock-a-block of examples where even though you think you're smart, you read it and go, God, I would have fallen for that one as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we're falling for those things all the time. Uh, while you're talking, I, I realized um, belatedly where I first heard about this stuff from, the, the ideas talked about thinking fast and slow. I think it was in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I think he tends to, uh, you know, as the title would would give away, he tends to concentrate on system one. Yes, in, in that yes. other than two. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yes, I mean, the, the danger, as always, is in not recognizing. You know, thinking that the danger here that all these theorists we've discussed so far is in thinking that emotion is intrinsically a good thing. Hmm. It's not necessarily a good thing if it leads you astray and you start coming up with sort of theories that are no better than astrology, you know, like uh, Myers-Briggs or learning styles would be a good example. People yeah. intuitively feel that emotionally it's right learning styles, you know, that people are auditory, visual or kinesthetic learners. There is no scientific basis for this whatsoever. And all the evidence points towards it being a destructive and bad thing when you apply it. Yeah. Nevertheless, people will defend it to the death because it feels right. And yeah. of course, uh, it feels right that the sun comes up in the morning and goes around the earth. But the very opposite is the truth, of course. Hmm. And this is why we. This is why I'm a big believer in listening to the science and learning because there's a lot of flat earth theory out there that is proven wrong by the research. Yeah. And we must, like every other area of human endeavor, look at the evidence and accept that this is the case. Hmm. Uh, and. You know, Kinman really uncovers those biases in some detail, showing that teaching has biases, learners have biases, and that the act of teaching and learning is very often to block those biases and think more rationally about things and get away from our emotions. I think that's a really interesting idea that you, you can't change the biases, so you have to change the structure of the process around, yes. around that instead of that. that, that. Yeah, that's something to think about. There's a, great, there's a great example of that, by the way, because they made, the, they made their name really in pilot training. Mm. And so they, found, they did an analysis of, you know, with, uh, plane crashes and found that a lot of it was human error. And a lot of it came down to the fact that the pilot was king of the cockpit 
and wouldn't listen to the co-pilot or evidence that was coming from other sources. So what Kane and Tversky did, they reversed this. They changed pilot training forever and refo refocused. They looked at the decision-making process when things were going badly wrong and encouraged criticism of the decision made by the person in charge. In other words, they flipped it round on its head and made sure it was more collegiate so you got all your data points right to avoid the crash. And that's how the pilots are now trained in that sense. Criticism, very important thing. Yeah. So moving on, and now it feels like we, we've come very close to home with this last person, Nick Shackleton-Jones. He's well known to both of us. He was, I think, yeah. the third interviewee on The Learning Hack. Um, I remember saying to somebody that I'd started this podcast, and they say, who you got on next? And I said, um, Nick Shackleton-Jones. And uh, they said, oh, you'll be all right with that. Nick is box office. And he's a very well-known name in uh, learning development at the moment. Um well known among other things for his effective context theory uh yeah. and uh, an another kind of link here is that you share a publisher with him i think if, if i'm yeah. i'm right and his book book how people learn uh which of course i had to read all the way through because i was going to interview <laughs> i've actually <laughs> yeah. read and and thought was in enormously interesting he he sort of takes ebbinghaus to task a bit right up the the, the front yeah. um and have some quibbles with that. But I think it is a really interesting book and it brings a lot of this stuff together. I think what he basic, you know, if I'm going to boil it down, basic, his basic thing is you can't learn anything. You can't learn something if you don't care about it. And yeah. the biggest trick, and you know, actually is the first thing you have to do is to make people care about it. And there's some, and, and there are various strategies for when it's something that people aren't going to care about, like kind of compliance learning and so on. Um, but you know more about it than I do, Donald. So can you put him into context here? Um, does he put the cap on on the effective area or does he just add something slightly different? Yeah, well, the interesting thing, interesting for me because I love philosophy as well. And uh, the thing about Nick is he, he throws, he, he really throws Plato and Descartes out the window as, uh, as Damasio did. Uh, and because the, the, he thinks that philosophy has produced this artificial distinction between reason on one hand and, and emotion on the other, and that yeah. there is no such dualism, really. You know, it's much more complicated. And actually, he unusually, and I think uh, I admire him for this, he actually brings in two other names that, that people uh, may not have read. Uh, one is incredibly difficult to read, the other is more popular, perhaps, and that's Heidegger and Nietzsche. So yeah. with Heidegger, there is this sense of, no, actually, there isn't reason and emotion is two separate strands here. Actually, there is this sense of being, you know? What is fundamental? It's being in the world. That's what learners feel like, you know? And it's very much, I feel like, caring. You have to care about, pay it, you know, your attention is drawn to things because you care about them. And similarly with Nietzsche. So he draws upon these, uh, uh, these two towering figures in philosophy and comes up with his, his view that learning is an effective process, you know, and the book, How People Learn, published two, two or three years ago now, uh, builds on this. And I was, he, he, he defends learning. He still thinks that, you know, learning is about changing behavior uh, as a result of memory. Memory hasn't gone out the window. He's not throwing uh, uh, the baby out with the bathwater when he critiques uh, Ebbinghaus. Uh, but memory is, he thinks, is stored as an emotional or affective response to an experience, okay? Mm -hmm. So that it can be reconstructed when you recall it or reinforce it and bring it to mind from long-term memory again. He thinks this is fundamentally, uh, uh, like Damasio, he thinks that emotion is fundamental to the way we remember things and mm -hmm. also recall them, which is why we have to play to this uh, phenomenon if we're going to be good teachers and good learners. So in designing, you know, if you're going to design this stuff, you better pay, better make damn sure that you design stuff that really matters to people, that they have to care about it. You know, it's part of them being in the world that they uh, that they are drawn toward towards what they have to learn from or the learning experience itself. Okay, mm. so this notion of bringing to the surface or uncovering. The, uh, what the learners care about really matters to Nick. And I think, uh, I think that's right, actually. I think that's admirable. 
it's, it, in that sense, he's massively user centric, <laughs> and he mm. uh, dismisses a lot of the extra sort of structures that come around learning design because of that. He thinks it's absolute focus on what people care about in the workplace or in university or in schools really, really does matter. I'm not wholly convinced that this is right myself, but I think he is really consistent and built a brilliant picture around this, uh, that, that user analysis is absolutely essential. It's not just useful, it's absolutely essential. It's fundamental to designing learning. Time to sum up. Um, and the, the picture I'm getting here is that something is being put back in to the, the question that wasn't there before. I'm gonna use a metaphor, um, which is very, very topical for, the, for this uh, topic. Um, baby and bathwater, um, you know, there's they, this is kind of baby of emotion that constantly thinkers are trying to throw out um, and we end up yep. with a load of bathwater uh, with it, without baby in. It, it, would, would that be true? And it, if so, why is it so hard to keep that baby in the bath? And it, it seems to keep sliding out. Is, is this is it going to be a constant effort? Do you think as we go forward to always remember emotion, remember to put it back in there, not just to focus on the positives and like HR people tend to do, talk fridge magnets to each other, but recognise that the passions also in, in, include uh, kind of grief and rage and impatience and, and and all the rest of it. There's a question in there somewhere, Donald. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, I get, I get what you're after there. Right? I think the problem with emotions in learning is that it's a rather inquiet, nebulous, vague sort of swirl of things. Mm. It's very difficult to you get your handle on it. Now, all the theorists that we've mentioned before have very definitely tried to get a handle on it by coming up with taxonomies, the role in design, right through to the role in design and learning. But maybe we could sum it up with some really practical points here because, you know, I think we started with this notion of emotion being fundamentally a good motivator is what drives us forward. All the theorists believe that this is true, that positive emotions are a good thing. But there's another side to the coin here, which is avoiding overstimulation. Too much positive emotion is not a good thing. So we've seen lots of evidence in virtual reality training, for example, where you're in that thing, but you're so overstimulated, you're not learning a damn thing. You know, you're staring at the textures or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, this is true, I think, also of games and gamification. There's quite powerful evidence showing that overstimulation is catastrophic for learning. Yeah. And there was this idea that, and then secondly, on top of that, you know, the idea that all learning should be fun and that video learning is great, but not if it produces just the illusion you feel as though you're learning because mm -hmm. you're watching the video. But actually, when you test you afterwards, the transience effect, well researched, shows that you think you're learning, but you're not really, because all mm. the memories are burning up behind you as you're watching this thing, because of the limitations of working memory. And so I think uh, we're getting to really understand now how emotion can be positive in terms of motivation, self-regulation, but also negative in terms of overstimulation or negative feelings about yourself as a failure in the learning mm. process is very common in schools of course yeah now there's a big tension here which needs to be resolved and that's the tension between engagement and effort we know that learning means effort by the learner you don't learn a damn thing you don't learn how to play the guitar without playing the guitar you know it takes a lot of practice there's a lot of effort the trouble here is a lot of that effort can be isn't emotional it's not about being happy a lot of it's quite painful you know there's a lot of sort of sore fingertips <laughs> and yeah. disappointment <laughs> in that process. Nevertheless, you know, this idea that positive emotions are really what should be encouraged all the time is a bit odd because anybody who's really been involved in deep learning knows that the deeper satisfaction comes through hard effort, perseverance and challenge, even pain. Mm. So I think we have to be really careful about this binary split between good and bad emotions. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't ma that doesn't work at all here, yeah. uh, but paying due care and attention to overstimulation to avoid it, to being just reliant on fun and engagement and imagining that that's all there is to learning. Well, it's easy to people to make people happy. What's harder is to make people make the effort to learn to overcome difficulties. And that's where it all goes wrong, you know, because those who love emotion and learning think it's all about just fun and keeping people happy and nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. 
I think an interesting postscript to all this is we're really technology is playing a really interesting role here now. So the the area I've been involved in on the artificial intelligence stuff, and I wrote about this in my book on AI for learning, is sentiment analysis is an area of artificial intelligence that uses these incredibly clever uh, mathematical techniques to look at what you've written. Let's just say all your social media content or social stuff within a social context in an organization, or even questionnaires you've responded to, looks at that text and it's clever enough to identify what you feel. Mm. You know, in other words, uh, because there are certain aspects of language, as Lakoff showed us, we betray our feelings through language. Mm. So you can actually read the social stuff and see whether people are feeling good or bad about a course, or whether mm. they're starting to drop off and feel as though they're failing. That may be predictive. You can take that data and say, well, this person's likely to drop out from this course in a couple of weeks because they're clearly getting demotivated. Mm. And you can start to provide personal interventions then based on emotional data from text. This is a brand new area, but it's a really rather wonderful thing. And it's, it's nascent, but it, it will come of age. It's already coming of age and being used in anger in some learning experience platforms, one of which I, you know, I, I worked on for a while. So I think the social learning data, predicting failure and dropout, reading the runes of emotion is starting to take place now. And that provides personalized target, targeted notifications and support for the learner to prevent them from failing. So I think the technology, funnily enough, oddly, something cold and dry as technology could be playing a key role in reviving the role of emotion in learning by reading the subjective feelings that learners have as they learn. Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, something I found when I was um, reading Nick's book as well was the, the idea that this tends to foreground um, when, when you talk about using emotion in learning, obviously it is used differently um, to the way that it would be used in a, in a book or, in, or on a poem or something. But it obviously has a very, very central role. And it kind of makes you think a lot about how we use create creativity um, in the creation of learning. And obviously, you know, uh, e-learning companies are full of creative people, you know, graphics yeah. and writers and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and, and while it's working differently, I, I, th I think what we've, we've heard about today, just tell you, you do have to be a real expert in the emotions, the passions, in, in order to make it work well within learning. And it, it, as you say, you know, emotions is a terrible stew. I mean, we, we've had a taxonomy of the passions here and so on, but who would we normally look to to be really expert in negotiating their way around the, these feelings? Well, Maybe someone like Shakespeare, Proust, Chekhov. These are the people who plumb the depths of the human heart and are ex experts uh, in, in in its secrets and so on. And maybe you really do need a quite a high level of creativity to make that work within a, a learning context. Yeah, rather than oh, get me a graphic designer and I'll treat yeah. you like a mill worker <laughs> of well, the Nick, information age. Nick, go, Nick goes into this in some detail and I remember this I remember this because it's got it's another one of those Clarks we've come across the name Clark all the time keeps popping up and there was a paper by Bauer and Clark in 1969 or something quite old which Nick quotes which is all about you know this notion of stories being a very effective way of bringing emotion to the table as it were you know yeah. because stories have that role in improving memory recall and so the, this whole thing about effective, uh, effective learning, uh, you know, I think, according to Bower and Clark and Nick Shackleton Jones, has been gloriously ignored and dismissed. But actually, the storytelling thing brings it back to the fore, and that's mm. where your notion there—a very good example of you know of creativity comes back into place because you have to make people care. So how do we make people care? Why do people watch movies and plays and Shakespeare? Because it makes them care about something. Uh, and I think Nick is definitely onto something there. On the other hand, you have to be careful about because you have to be good at this. You know, bad stories are worse than, than no mm. stories at all in many ways. And yeah. not all learning is storytelling. But nevertheless, I think these these theorists in general, Nick in particular, are really onto something there when they you know, they get, they're they getting away from that old blank slate theory, really, which is, you know, that people are just waiting to be filled up with knowledge, which is why Nick and others, many other theorists, uh, are coming up with all these learning, uh, learning, uh, learning platforms that are delivering things like 
well, quickly checklist, you know, don't be worried about, you know, that's what, if somebody really cares about solving a problem, they want to solve it quickly and effectively. Don't give them a three hour online learning program about it. Give them the checklist or the job aid or the steps to solve the problem hmm. when they need it. So Nick is Nick and these other theories aren't about just storytelling and huge emotional, uh, uh, you know, constructs in design. They're about what does that person really need? What do they care about? What do they need to solve the problem? What are they after here in that context? So Nick's a big fan of that type of stuff. Resources, not courses, is one of his mantras. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, the technology is coming to pass now that allows that to happen. Hmm. Well, I certainly feel more full of knowledge after uh, that hour than I did before. So thank you very much for that, Donald. And I, I, I hope the uh, listeners and viewers will as well. Yeah. I hope you're not emotionally drained, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, perhaps by uh, Storm Eunice. Um, oh, yes, you know, yes. Yeah. That, 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 I've, I've had a little Sturm und Drang today, um, <laughs> courtesy of, of Eunice. Well, thanks very much as usual, John. That was a, a pleasure. It's always great to sort of regurgitate this stuff again, you know, because it's always swirling around. But it's a really important area of motion and learning. And people are drawn to it because, as I said at the beginning, it's a bit of, va of a vacuum. But hopefully we've filled that vacuum out a little bit with some of the main theorists in the field. Absolutely. Expert fillers of vacuums. That's what they'll write on our grades. Yeah. OK, thanks a lot. Thank you, John. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and we'd like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. In the next episode, Donald and John take on a topic that has given rise to a number of popular buzz phrases over past decades, from electronic performance support to learning in the flow of work. We're calling the episode Workflow Learning. Join us, won't you?